Hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with you another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and it is an honor and a privilege to serve you and teach you today. Step into my virtual math classroom where we got baseball on. National League Division Series, Dodgers vs. Nationals tied two games apiece, best of five series, next one moves on to the championship series to play the Cardinals. Uh, my Braves lost, unfortunately. They lost in their best of five series, three games to two. Cardinals beat them 13-1 to today. They scored 10 runs in the first inning. I was glad I wasn't able to see it, because I was teaching. Um, now here I might be teaching while Dodgers put on a shellacking. They're up 3-0 early. They got uh, Walker Buehler pitching. It's going to it's gonna be disappointing if they win. But you know what? Giants, um, you know, I, I'm a Giants fan first, Braves second. It's kind of a 1A and 1B. But uh, Giants rivals versus uh, Braves rivals. I still want the Braves rivals to kind of win this one here. Uh, okay, so what do I have for you today, though, math-wise? Today we're going to be looking at relations and functions and how we understand them. That's right, kids. Today I'm going to talk to you about how a relation becomes a function or which specific relations are functions, and we're going to look at them in multiple representations. We're going to be looking at coordinate pairs, tables, mapping, uh, mapping diagrams, graphs, a couple situations, and we get to tie them all in and see how we can determine which one's a function based on any representation that we see. I don't think equations come into play, even though the situations can bring about equations, but excuse me, they're mostly discrete functions until we look at some more of the graphs at the very end. I have 22 practice problems for us to try and do today. I hope this one actually goes kind of fast. Um, let me just talk to you about functions really quickly and relations. A relation, a relation is any sort of set of XY ordered pairs. Whether you see them as, here, let me show you kind of what the first problems look like. When you see these things, See this ordered pair here? This is a relation. This is a set of values that are arranged to make a set. All right, these four points. And I can make them as a table, as a graph, and you guessed it, as a good old mapping diagram over here. Among many other things, I'm sure. Okay, but they relate in whatever way that they determine and see fit. That's a relation. Now a function is a relation where for every x value, there exists only one y value. Now we'll see which ones are functions or not whenever they ask us to do it. Let's talk about relations just first. You've done relations your entire life with math, you just didn't know it. Let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Number one and number two are the same kinds of setup of questions. Once you see this one, number two will go a lot faster. Okay, express each relation as a table, as a graph, and as a mapping diagram. I'm sure you know the first two. Let's make sure we know what that last one looks like. Number one, the relation represents ages of students and the number of words they can write per minute. So again, students, when they're saying that respectively, they're saying ages of students is gonna represent X, number of words they can write is gonna represent Y. So there is a word problem context within here. We just wanna make sure that we know how to tie that into play. These have actual references. Cool, so let's go and check this out, see what they got. Um, so five comma 10 gives me that X, Y coordinate pair. I'm gonna go ahead and write that in the table. Six comma 20 is right here, six comma 23, and then seven comma 35. There's one way you can represent an ordered pair just like that, or that relation, excuse me, the relation of ordered pairs. Uh, now I have this graph right here, and as they scale it for us, uh, up by fives here, over by ones here, I have ages five, six, and seven, so I'm gonna look over here, five comma 10, it's gonna be boop. Six comma 20 is way up here, 6 comma 23, it's a little bit between 20 and 25, a little more than halfway, about right there. And 7 comma 35 is up there. They're not asking us to connect the dots. That's, it's not one of those kinds of things. You're just, just plotting them. There's going to be a visual understanding of how plotting them can help you determine whether or not it's a function. We'll do that in good time. And the ages in words per minute right here, this is the x's. And you know, this creates what's kind of called our domain. When you do a mapping diagram, which is what this is, what we're gonna do is list out the domain and range vertically down in increasing order. No duplicates will be written. In other words, I won't write a number more than once. I think that six appears more than once. And what we're gonna do is we're going to point arrows, arrows from an X value to its corresponding Y value that exists in this relation set. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm gonna go ahead and write down the numbers five, six, and seven for the three different year or ages that appear here. Six will not be written twice, just once. Words per minute, we have 10, 20, 23, and 35. They were already in increasing order here, and that helps for me to do it on this stage here. 
Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm doing it right now, please hold. I'm going to be drawing arrows from, let's use a different color, drawing arrows from these values here to these values here based on which values corresponded to make an ordered pair. Five will go to 10 because there's a point on this graph that's five comma 10, right there. Six will go to 20 and it will also go to 23. So I'm gonna draw two separate arrows here because those are the two coordinate pairs, 620 and 623, and then seven goes to 35. And boom, that's a mapping diagram. Not all of them look this clean and pretty. Uh, as X increased, so did Y, so it made it look easier. There wasn't like a big intertwining set like this, which can happen, um, but not this one right here. And we have finished number one, okay? So again, what we're doing is we made different representations just as practice. We know that a relation can appear in many different forms. We're gonna do that again in problem number two, and eventually we're gonna talk about which ones make functions and which ones do not. Not here, but that's okay. Problem number two, the relation represents the place one in a track meet and the number of points that place finish is worth. So if you finish first place, you receive five points. It looks like the X is the place that you receive and the Y is the number of points that you earn. Those are kind of thick, let's reduce that thinness. First place gets five points, second place gets three points, third place gets two points, fourth place gets one point, and fifth place gets zero points. It looks like it holds some good value to win because this one has a difference of two, the other ones have a difference of one. Looks like there's no value to place fifth. Um, so let's go ahead and plot these on a graph right here, one comma five, two comma three, 3, 2, 4, 1, and 5, 0. It's almost linear up until you reach this. And by the way, these are discrete functions. I mentioned in the other one I don't connect the dots. These are discrete, or I shouldn't say functions, it is. But these are discrete relations right here. I'm not going to connect the dots. You can't place one and a half. Um, we talked about discrete and continuous in the last video. That's why I'm bringing it up. And I'm going to do the same thing here. I have a, uh, in increasing order, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then in increasing order for range, the points, I'm going to start with zero. And I'm going to put zero, one, two, three, and five. No repeats. But what you have to be careful of this time is make sure they map to the specific value. One is going to map with five over here. So one goes down with five like that. And then two maps with three. Three maps onto two. Four and one and five and zero. A little more cluttered, but not not something out of complete disarray. It was just kind of negatively correlated. The higher you ranked in place in a bad way, the lower your value was. So it makes sense that it went crisscross. See, this is still legible. I can read what's happening here. I can see that the fifth place arrow is still stemming to that zero point value. That works for me. Hopefully it works for you. That's the end of question number two. Why don't we just move forward? Questions number three, four, and five are the same instructions. We are going to state the domain and range of each relation. Now I have three different representations to be able to do this, so let's go ahead and play with it. X's represent the domains. What X values exist in your relation, in your set? And I'm gonna go and do that for two different colors here. I'm gonna do blue for number three. And as I list things in a list, um, I'm gonna use curly braces to represent that. In increasing order with the table, and the table is going in increasing order, this works. Let's just write out two, seven, eight, 11 and 15. And the range are the Y values that exist in your relation here. And again, no duplicates, just like a mapping diagram. And write them in increasing order, just like a mapping diagram. We go 5, 8, 15, 12, and 19. To be fair, the, map, the uh, domain and range list came before mapping diagrams. It's like, it's not a chicken or egg scenario. This thing was born first. So I shouldn't say like a mapping diagram like we did in the mapping diagram. That's number three, that's all we gotta put, list, state the domain and range. Uh, number four, same kind of thing, state the domain and range here, and I'm gonna use green. So for domain, it's the X values, and again, in increasing, the good, the good news is, oh, look at this, I should've, look at this mapping diagram, I'm not happy about this. They did not do increasing order. See, a mapping diagram should be doing domain and range as we do them increasing order. Not a fan of this. And I'm not saying it's not allowed. Just not a fan of it. Mostly because I told you one thing and now we're going to do the other. 
I'm going to list my mapping diagrams and domain and ranges in increasing order always. It's just a better organization tactic. I know that sometimes arrows can intertwine in a weird way, but uh, take my word for it. So now I got to check increasing order. Yes, indeedy. 57, 68, 93, and 99. Those are my X values that exist here. And range, uh, 2 and 9. And again, increasing order. Um, now, what's interesting about domain and range here, and I want to make sure that this makes sense. It's going to be kind of strange. If you had a table of values or a set of ordered pairs that were listed, there's a chance of a duplicate set of points. There was a point on number 3 that's 2, comma 5. And on a table, if they happen to list 2, comma 5 twice, that could potentially be okay. There might be a problem like, uh, what was the first one? Uh, ages and number of words they could write per minute. Let's say a two-year-old could write five words per minute, just for the sake of argument. There's a two-year-old that could do that, and say there was another two-year-old that could as, uh, as well. You're not going to not list them twice. You will list them twice in a table. So when you're looking at number three, you might have seen another, sorry, two, five right here, just like it is right there. And duplicates will appear in tables. They could. In this homework, I have no idea. I haven't done it yet. But in a mapping diagram, or on domain and range lists, you do not list duplicates. If two appeared twice, you're just going to write it once in here. The point I'm going to try and make with this is that in this mapping diagram right here, I have no, absolutely no idea whether or not there were multiple points that were represented more than once. Just want to let you know that. There could have been two points that are 57 comma 9, or seven of them, and I would have been none the wiser. I would have no idea. That's okay. That's the point of a mapping diagram. It reduces clutter. It shows that those points exist, not the frequency of them. That's cool for me. Okay, number five. Let's look at these ordered pairs. Uh, I'm not going to write them out, but let's look at these ordered pairs. Negative three comma negative three. Negative one comma zero. One comma... F oh, you know what? I just messed up. See? This is my fault. It's not negative three comma three. Look at the scales. Negative 6, comma, negative 6. Negative 2, comma, 0. There we go. 2, comma, 4. 4, comma, negative 4. 6, comma, negative 6. 8, comma, 0. And 8, comma, negative 4. All right. Those were the ordered pairs. All of those have a certain set of x values and a certain set of y values. And all you got to do is list them. What x values do appear in this graph? That's what's being asked. So let's go ahead and do them. That's the domain. Which x values appear? And increasing orders just left to right, baby. That's all I got to do. Negative 6 appears. Negative 2 appears. Not 0. 2. Remember, this is on x. x equals 2. Um, 4. 6. And 8. Which appears twice. But like I mentioned, I'm only going to write it once. All right. Range, you know, just like the, uh, just like x here, only I'm going to go from down to up, increasing order. So the lowest I get is negative 6 on range, just like domain. And then we get negative 4. 0, which, and by the way, all these have appeared twice. Negative 6 appeared twice, negative 4 appeared twice, 0 appears twice. Uh, looks like 4 only appears once. So there we go. It's my domain and range for that set right there. Okay, so that's basically how those problems work. We're just rummaging through what X and Y values appear. That's all domain and range is. And it's a lot easier for lists, I'd argue, than it is for uh, continuous functions with intervals where you got to use in, um, inequalities. I don't even know if that appears on here. We'll find out soon enough. That was numbers 3, 4, and 5. And go ahead to number 6 here. Number 6, state the domain and range of each relation. Interpret in context and explain if it is a function or not. So now we're going to have the function portions here finally. At this point, you know, the um, uh, before I go on with this, I think this kind of problem set appears because I did paste these in. I think we get a lot of these instructions over and over. So you're going to see a lot of different word problem varieties and uh, what happens. We have to state the domain and range to start. I'm going to go ahead and highlight these in green for domain and range. Interpret in context, meaning make sense of what is actually happening, what they're saying about it, and explain if it's a function. Um, that's again for every x there can only exist one y value okay the relation represents the age of each student and the number of pets the student has 
Um, now in green, I'm going to be doing the domain and range. Let's go ahead and write that out. And range. Okay, here we go. Domain, 6, 8, 9, and 11. And range, um, earliest one first, 0. No negative pets, you can understand. 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Looks like no mapping diagrams here. Uh, interpret in context. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to decide if they're asking about interpreting the domain and range in context. I, maybe. The domain represents all the different ages of the children or the, or the, the uh, student, the students that appear here. All the ranges from 6 to 11. I shouldn't say range. The uh, span from 6 to 11, 6, 8, 9, and 11. And in context, the number of pets that are possible here, 0, 1, 2, or 3. That's my interpretation. I, I hope that that's what they're saying here. For the table thing, a six-year-old has three pets, an eight-year-old has two pets, a nine-year-old, etc. Now there's an 11-year-old that has one pet and another 11-year-old that has two pets. Now when I talk about functions here, it's gonna be interesting because this problem doesn't really give me the best idea of why we say that things are functions in real-world context. But in math-based context, if I have two different y's for a single x value, then it is not a function. I guess the tie-in is, let's say they wanted to choose a single 11-year-old. They want to make sure that they ensure every time they choose that 11-year-old, they see the same number of pets each time. And if there are multiple 11-year-olds, you, can, you can't always guarantee you'll get the same number of pets because here I have two different 11-year-olds, one with one pet and one with two pets right here. So explain if it is a function or not. I mean, I'll, I'll write in this case because of these two 11-year-olds having two different values here, the same x having two different y's, 11 comma 1 and 11 comma 2. Because of that, this is not a function. Okay. Now, I believe this is going to happen a lot when it comes to it. You would probably have to explain more in writing. I'm saying it out loud and circling things and showing you that. The duplicate amount of x's with different y's means it's not a function. You'll see a lot of these. So if you're still stuck on it, let's see if we can see a few more. This time we're going to have a graph, same kind of thing. State the domain and range, interpret in context, and explain if it is a function or not. Again, I don't know if they, okay, I think that they interpret in context. I'm, I'm iffy on what specifically they might be asking, if it's domain and range or just the situation. I think I'm going to interpret the situation for you, if that's okay. Domain and range somewhat speak for themselves. All right, domain and range right here. Um, the x values, or h, no, x, h is in hours. The uh, x values right here represent my domain. They are, in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the range values right here, we hit 50, 100, 150, and 200. So those are the four different values that hit here. Interpret in context. Um, now I don't no oh oh uh, let's see time time driven and the number of miles traveled okay at the end of each hour so let's say that this is one person driving and this is going to help if we get another version like this for a non-function type wink wink this one is a function say that someone's driving and after an hour long drive this is how I'm going to interpret it after an hour long drive they have traveled 50 miles total after two hours they have traveled a total of 100 miles not 100 miles just from the first hour to the second, but 100 total. After the third mile, they had traveled 150. Third hour, they've traveled 150 miles. Now the fourth hour, they have still only traveled 150 miles. The interpretation of this part is they probably rested for an hour, okay, or stopped, whatever they did. They ate, they ran out of gas, they, just whatever you want to put for it. They haven't driven. Hour number five, it looks like they added another 50 miles to their trip and got to 200 miles total. Okay, so that's my interpretation. Now, is this a function? Um, yes, I'm going to say this is a function. Now, how come? I mentioned something before about duplicates. You got to avoid duplicates. Well, here I have duplicate y values for the same x. I have the point 3, comma 150, and I have the point 4, comma 150. Mr. Robinson, if there are duplicates, why is it a function? Because it's duplicates on y. 
and not duplicates on X. And this is important, especially if time, and this and this one I can make use of, I can make actual sense of here. Um, because it's the same car driving, I assume, as you're driving here, you get to monitor these different times. It's possible, realistically, for a car to be in the same spot at two different times. As time moves forward, you can still stay in the same place. And that's what's happening here. You're allowed to have the same Y for two different X's. And as long as time is represented in terms of X, that's going to function properly. Here's something that would not function properly. Let's ignore this four just for a moment. Pretend like that point instead was right here. There was a fourth point that was right here at 3 comma 175. 3 comma 175. Now is this a function? Well, it's not because you have two y's for the same x. Now I want you to think about the context of the situation and see if it makes sense. Again, assuming this is one individual car that's traveling. Your car is 50 miles in after an hour, 100 after two hours, 150 after three hours, and 175 after three hours. Huh? A hundred after hour at hour number three, I'm 150 miles into my journey. Into hour number three, I'm 175 miles into my journey. That 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 doesn't work. <laughs> you can't be in two places at the same time. That doesn't function properly. Something's messed up. You must be tracking a different car or a different parallel universe, right? This is a different scenario where this thing's occurring here. You can't have this. That doesn't function. This is not a function in this case. So you can't have multiple y's for the same x. That's the idea of functions for us. There are other reasons, and honestly, it has a lot to do with the fact that y is a dependent variable. Say we had, which we won't, say we had a y equals mx plus b. If I substitute values for my independent variable x, I only expect one answer out for y. I shouldn't be able to plug in 3 for x and sometimes get 150 for y and sometimes get 175 for y. It doesn't work like that. Anyway, this is a function I'm going to move on, but hopefully this is starting to make sense with what can what you can and can't do. And there's a graphical way of seeing whether or not it's true that we'll run into at the end of this. Okay, number eight. The relation represents the number of hours a person is able to rent a canoe and the cost of renting the canoe for that many hours. Uh, now they want the domain and range, yada yada, so let's go and start off with that. Because it's in increasing order, this is very straightforward. One, two, three, four, five for x. And range, 11, 13, 15, and 17. Now, interpret in context here. Um, if you rent a canoe for one hour, it's going to cost $11. Two hours, it's going to cost $11. Three hours is 13. Oh, is this uh, cost per hour? Let's see. Cost of renting the canoe for that many hours. Um, yeah, it's just uh, in total cost. You can basically rent it for two hours, and if you want to return it within the first hour, go ahead. Uh, rent it for an hour, but minimum two hours. Three hours, four hours, and five hours. Um, okay, so for this particular instance here, you know, it's, it's just for the many hours that you go. I guess it's possible, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this. I was I'm thinking about whether or not we can talk about these functions being discrete or continuous. They're they're labeled as discrete, but I'm sitting there thinking what you can't you can't rent it for one and a half hours. I mean, what happens in that scenario? You know, I was thinking about that with the time one over here, and I said time is always a continuous function. This one's interesting though because they're talking about travel at the end of each hour. So it's just marking it at those points. Right? And I mentioned that time is always continuous, which it is, but it depends on what you're measuring, I guess. End of each hour is a different story. With this one, it doesn't say at the end of the hour, let's go ahead and just assume that these ones are discrete, just for the sake of argument. This is how they list them. That's how I'm going to list domain and range. Um, but yeah, after two and a half hours, how much would it cost? I'm going to guess it's going to cost $13 because um, you've hit your two hour mark at that point. At that point, they're just going to charge you more. So after three hours, it's going to be $13, four hours, $15, and five hours, $17. That's the context. Okay, now is this thing a function? So going back to the kind of same idea, does every x only have one y value to it? So in a mapping diagram, what's cool about these is we can actually visually see whether or not that's true. Every single x here only has one arrow coming out from it. That means that yes, every x only has one y. Okay, now this y happens to be shared with these two x's and I guess that's fine, you can rent a boat 
for 11, a canoe for 11 hours or for, excuse me, for one hour or two hours and have it cost $11 and, you know, some, some place is going to charge and allow that. Because again, I assume it's $11 for the first two hours. That's just kind of how it's running. Um, I wasn't going to say that, but you know, you can't, you can't rent it for one hour and for some people charge $11 and for some people charge $13 just for one hour. You're going to charge it the same amount for that one hour each time. So uh, yes, this is a function in the same kind of way that I mentioned before. For every x, there's only one y. Uh, yes, function. Okay, now um, I don't know if we're going to see mapping diagrams with this later, so I'm going to go ahead and just show you it. If this two happened to point to another value like this, it points to two values like that, that's when you say not a function. Any mapping diagram that shows this even once means not a function. That doesn't happen here, so we don't have that. Moving on. Number nine, a person can burn about six calories per minute bicycling. Okay, six calories per minute. Let X represent the number of minutes bicycled, and Y represents the number of calories burned. Create a mapping diagram to show the number of calories burned by bicycling for this many minutes. Um, okay, so again, assume discrete. We'll just say at the end of each hour, the 60 minutes, 120, at the end of each hour, we'll call it discrete when we do the domain and range. Um, so we'll go ahead and say 60. 120, 180, and 240. Okay, uh, you you burn 60 calories per minute. So 60 calories, or excuse, six, six calories per minute. If we multiply this by a certain number of minutes here, by the X minutes that we do, what's awesome with this is we're gonna get an expression, minutes cancel, you're left with calories. You have an expression that says six X calories are gonna be burned by calories being the number of minutes right here. This is an expression that says how many calories you burn after X minutes. So after 60 minutes, we're gonna be doing six times 60, and that's how many calories you would have burned at that time. That's 360 total calories burned. So calories in this case is 360. Let's do it in black. After 120 minutes, that's gonna be 720 calories burned. So that's 720. After 180 minutes, that is 1080. I was gonna say 10,080. 1080, 10, 1080, 1080 calories burned. And after 240 minutes, that is 1440 calories burned. All right. So we computed those. There are a lot of ways you can do that. I'm showing the uh, algebraic expression version. And with the mapping diagram here, I'm just going to point the uh, number of minutes to number of calories that map to it straight across. That works out. No duplicates. That's my domain and range. Oh, I got to do that. Domain and range. Domain, 60, 120, 180, 240. And range is on the other side. Now, is this a function? Does every uh, x only map to one y? Yep. This will be... Uh, this will be a function indeed. Um, keeping in mind the same idea, when you've wrote a certain number of minutes, it won't be possible to have two different sets of calories being burned. Whereas you could ride for 60 minutes and 120 minutes and have burned the same number of calories if you really think about not pedaling. You get the idea, though. It's possible that after 120 minutes, you can have burned the same number of calories as after 60 minutes, especially if you're eating while you're riding a bike. Um, okay. Uh, oh, function. Yes. Function. I'm just going to write function or not function. In this case, function here. Okay. Number 10. The table represents a sample of ages of people and their shoe size. Let's do domain and range. I'm going to speed up on these now, if that's okay with you. I realize I chirp a little. Uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I feel a lot more confident with this one being... Oh, nope, not a 14. I feel a lot more confident with this one being a discrete function. 15, 15, 16. I just made a mistake. Can't talk while writing. Um, I feel a lot more confident uh, just writing these as discrete ones. Ages, yes, they're decimal ages. Like, especially when you're a kid, you can be three and a half years old. Um, but in these particular instances right here... Don't write any duplicates. Ten and a half is not a duplicate. Um, and shoe sizes only can come in, I guess, the halves, maybe the quarters, but not in like tenths. So these are discrete, at least the ones that we see right here. There's our domain and range. Interpret in context. There is an 11-year-old with a shoe size of 7, 12-year-old with a shoe size of 8, etc. 
A uh, thir- 13 and a 15 year old both have a shoe size of 10. That's possible. You just can't have a 13 year old with two different shoe sizes. Maybe when he turns 15, he still has a shoe size of 10. Um, a 15 year old, 10 and a half, and a 16 year old with 11. Okay. So uh, is that a function then? Um, and you know what we're looking for are there duplicates of any x's with y's? So while this is okay, this is not okay with different shoe sizes here. A 15 year old shoe size 10, 15 year old shoe size 10 and a half. I'm not saying it's not okay in the real world. I'm saying that in the real world, if you were looking at them as the same person, they wouldn't have two different shoe sizes ideally with that specific shoe. Okay, I know there are a lot of argumentative things there, but for every x, there can only exist one y. I have the same x here with two different y's. That's not okay. Not a function. And there you have it. Not a function. Okay, here we go. Number 11, an electrician charges a base fee of $75 plus $50 for each hour of work. The minimum the electrician, electrician charges is $175. Create a table that shows the amount the electrician charges for one, two, three, and four hours of work. Okay, ideally, what you might start doing when you write this, obviously, one, two, three, and four, we want to represent time here, uh, time in hours for X. And for Y, we're going to do dollar amount charged. Okay. Now, what ideally you could start by writing is saying, okay, base fee of $75. That's cool. So we're going to do 75 uh, no, you don't want to do that because $50 for each hour worked, right? So there's mistake number one. So you do, okay, 75 is the initial just base fee, just like, okay, 75 just up front as a cost, and then 50 afterwards for each hour. So after one hour, 75 plus 50 is 125. But there's another mistake here. The minimum the electrician charges is $175. So this is kind of like the canoe scenario if you think about it. See, the first hour in the canoe was not $9. Remember it said 11, 11, 13, 15, 17. And keep in mind, I'm looking at this for the first time. Um, but it wasn't 9, 11, 13, 15, 75. So it's like, it kind of was a base fee of like seven, like the canoe example is really like a base fee of $7 and $2 for every hour renting the canoe with a minimum charging amount of $11. So it sounds weird that they say all of that, but in the end, what it shows you is this can't be 125 right here. This is still 175. That has to be the minimum amount. Either that or the guy has to stay there for at least two hours. I don't really know which one. But the two is still 175. That's the important part. One is imaginarily 125. So you might be asking why the heck they even mention all this. Well, I guess number one, to trick you. But number two, to give you the idea and the mention of, and this, this realistically happens, give you the idea of everything after this will be 50. And we'll be good from there. We're going to keep adding 50 in the hours that are forthcoming. Um, so to call it this base fee here, and the 50 each hour, and the minimum here, we still get to create this table in a nice way and say it's 50 then on out. Okay. So this is what this thing looks like. And we still have to state the domain and range and all that. So let's go ahead and do that. Domain, one, two, three, four. That is representing the number of hours worked. And again, continuous, technically, yes, you could stop after three and a half hours, probably still charge at the four. But see, they're not going to charge in between this bit right here. It's either 225 or 275. They won't charge 250 for three and a half hours, just because that's just how some things work. Uh, range, 175. I'm going to only say it once, 225 and 275. Now, there are two different x values with the same y value. That is OK. That is OK, because you, you can charge the same amount for different hours worked. You can't charge different amounts for the same hours worked. This is a function. OK. I'm just going to move on. Here we go. Number 12, the graph represents the average soccer goals scored for players of different ages, determine domain and range, etc., whether or not it represents a function, just like before. So, uh, okay, this time I'm not going to do tables, mapping diagrams, anything like that, just the graph. And I'm going to show you this for the first instance, how you can know whether a graph represents a function. I will do domain and range. Um, let's start with domain and range, actually. Domain, all the x values from left to right, we're looking at 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. Those have points on them. And these are, whoops, these are the, the ages 
of the girls. Looks like those are the only years that we're looking at. And the ranges, the only unique ones we see are one, two, three, and four. No zeros. One, two, three, four. Sorry for the bad curly brace. Again, don't write duplicates. Um, now, there are multiple eight-year-olds here. It says average soccer goals scored for players of different ages. Why would an eight-year-old average one and two soccer goals? That doesn't seem to function correctly. And you can see that right here. There are two different Ys for the same X. Basically, what I can do is draw a vertical line down this and say, look, my vertical line touched two different points. That's a non-functioning set right there. This single X value has more than one Y value. This one's fine. This one's fine. And this one's fine. The 8-year-old and the 12-year-old show two different soccer goal averages, which are not functions. What I'm doing with this green thing right now is actually called the vertical line test. And it's not something you have to draw. And furthermore, it's not something that you can do for yourself, like scanning like this. But this vertical line shows me that if I touch more than one point for any particular x value, I failed the vertical line test, and therefore it's not a function. Now, I'll be using this in a few problems down the road, I think starting on problem 18 or so. So pretend like, because I'm going to do this a couple times later, pretend like I'm scanning this thing. It's like a scanner. And if it hits a single point, it passes. If it hits more than one point, it fails. So here we go. Beep. Bang. Bang. Beep. Beep. So beeps are good, buzzes are bad. It buzzed twice. It only needs to buzz once to not be a function. And it's not a function. Not a function. Because multiple x's for the same, excuse me, multiple y's for the same x values at 8, four, eight and 12. Okay, not a function. Number 13 and 14, express each relation as a mapping diagram. Explain whether or not the relation represents a function. So again, all these are relations. Just, just to keep in mind, these are all relations here. Every single one. Only the functions are the ones without the uh, duplicate sets. We can look at whether or not they're functions straight up by seeing are there duplicate x's and different y's for those duplicate x's. Um, but we're going to do it in the mapping diagram here. So 13, 17, 22, 25, 33. 13... 17, 22, 25. Notice I'm looking at the x values for domain and range, looking at the y values. I'm going to go in increasing order. 17 and another 17. 22, 25, 33. And for a mapping diagram, you must draw the arrows to map one point to another. 13, 33. 17, 25. 22, 22, 25, 17. And 33, 17. Okay. Is this a function? Does any x point to more than one y? No. It does not point to, so it is a function. It, it, it is. As long as 13 is not pointing to two different things like that. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to say yes. Let's go ahead and oh, nice resounding yes. Function. Indeed. Mapping diagram here, the domain. Let's go increasing order again. One. 5, another 5, 7, and 11 is written twice here. Duplicates, that's all right. Uh, well, it's maybe not for function purposes, but that's all right to just write the 11 once. Uh, 2, 2, 4, uh, so 2, 4, 6, and 8 right here are the different y values. Let's go ahead and map them together. 1 goes to 2, 5 goes to 2, which is cool for a function. 5 goes to 4, that's not cool for a function. 5, this x, is pointing to two different y's. We can see that clear as day in the mapping diagram. This will not be a function. 7 goes to 6. 11 goes to 6, again, which is cool, but 11 goes to 8 right here, which is bad. The 5 and the 11 on x have two different sets of y values. This is not a function. The mapping diagram shows us that. No. Big whop and no. Okay. Number 15 and number 6. Okay, the rest of them, this will go very fast the rest of the way. The rest of them here are just use the vertical line test to determine if each relation is a function. Now I'm going to do that scanning thing just two more times just to play with it. It's just kind of fun for me to say that beep beep kind of thing. But uh, keep in mind you don't get to play with it that way. So afterward I'll just show you basically what you're going to do. Uh, right here the circle is our relation. Is it a function or not? As I scan across here and remember this is a continuous set of points right here. Each little part of the strand is a point. Point, 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 point. All of these are points right here. It's continuous. Now as I scan across this thing, if I hit right at negative, I think negative six right here, that's a single point that this vertical line touches, right at negative six comma zero. 
What about after negative six? It's hitting two points everywhere right here. Failing, failing, failing. To make sense of it, at this x value of two point something, I'm hitting this y value here and this y value here. It only takes once to fail the vertical line test, and it does it everywhere from negative six to positive six, non-inclusive. And I state non-inclusive because at six, it's only touching one single point tangentially right there as well. But it does fail. This is not a function. It is failing the vertical line test. I'll check this vertical line test right here. And as I scan across, look at this diagram. As I scan across, am I always only just hitting one y value for every x value? Basically, is it hitting just one point? Yes, 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 yes. It's passing everywhere. It has passed the vertical line test. This is a function right here. Now, you again, you might argue, well, there are two, uh, this x value and this x value share the same height. That's okay. That's allowed. You can have two different x's for the same y. Two different x's, excuse me, can have the same y, but no one x can have two different y's. So yes, this thing passes the vertical line test. Okay. Uh, number 17, this is a discrete function. You can see the graph guy right here and vertical line test. Let's go ahead and check it out again or an arrow. Fail. 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 No. Not a function. Two points for all three of those sets of x's. Very big fail. Passing so far. It touched that one point right there. Fail, 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 fail the rest of the way through. This is not a function. Two different y's for any particular x. Look at four, a y there and a y there. No good. Not a function. Okay, now you don't get the uh, luxury of being able to actually scan a vertical line, but all you have to do is just, just you know, look at it for yourself and, and determine, and I'll do it with this one with you. Just, you know, mimic and go like, okay, am I hitting any, so, uh, any two points for any vertical line that I draw? And you don't literally have to do that. I'm just showing you. No, you're not. It can get super close to looking like it's going to get vertical. This graph, it looks like a cubic function, never actually gets vertical. No matter what you say, going like, oh, look, it hits that point and that point and that point on X. No, it's still moving left. It never went vertical here. This thing is a function. It passes the vertical line test. Now, this one right here, which clearly fails, not only for something like here, but look at this. It fails at every point right here. Every single bit right here, point, 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 point. These are all the Y values for this one X value that it's failing at. That's no good. But all you have to do for these is draw a single vertical line to emphasize the point. It hit two of them, not a function. It hit two of them, not a function. That's all I got to do. That's all you got to do. Last two, 21 and 22. Passing the vertical line test? It seems to be. It's passing that vertical line test everywhere I go. Yeah, that looks to be a function. And, you know, again, the basic pinpoint thing of this, and I'm going to talk about it really more for the next one, this line right here, is I can make an equation out of this. In fact, this equation, this looks like y equals 2x plus 8. And I'm just stating that because I think it is. y equals 2x plus 8. This means when I plug a value into x into here, I better only get one y value out. That's what would make this thing be a function. It wouldn't make sense for this graph to go up this way and then somehow bounce back like this. And when I plug in negative 2 for x, I somehow get this value for y and this value for y. I should only get this one at y equals 4, not this random one here. But the graph doesn't look like that. It looks like this. And it looks like it's passing the vertical line test through and through. It only hits one x value one y value for every x value there. So yes, also a function. Okay, so that'll do it for this video right here. Um, it sped up very much at the end, hit 45 minute mark. I thought it would go fast, but I go to explaining, you know how I go. Um, okay, so hope you enjoyed that one. My name is Mr. Robinson. Leave any comments below if you want to know more and uh, take care.